Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, please. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Now, you'll remember last week that we looked at the author of eternal salvation, how the Lord Jesus Christ, that word author, is very important because it means that everything to do with eternal salvation resides in him alone, nowhere else, and in nothing else, and in no one else. We looked at that little word, and he is the author of eternal salvation. He became perfect. is isn't that there was a, anything wrong with him. There was no fault with him. The idea was that God brought him from the manger right to the grave and into glory again. And that is the leading, that's the idea, him being made perfect. And he went through uh, the, the very sequences of a priest to become our great high priest in the glory. And so we looked at him being the author of eternal salvation. And Christ is in him. He is salvation in him alone. Now will you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews 12, beginning to read at verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, not burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard and treated that he treated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The idea is that in the book of Hebrews, or this letter of Hebrews, is that it's from start to finish, it's meant to be read in one portion right the whole way through. That was the idea of the writing of it. It wasn't taken in little bits and pieces, but it was a letter rather than a book to be picked up, segmented off, and set down again. The idea of it was is that Hebrew uh, Christians coming from Judaism, turning away from the Jews' religion and on to Christ, and they're, they're professing Christ as their Savior. They've turned away from the temple and the sacrifice and the worship And because of hardship, because of Jewish persecution against them, their own fellow brethren, if you want, or religious uh, uh, fellow uh, workmen in their faith, they they are now persecuting them because they have turned away from that. The Apostle Paul was a prime example of how this happened and how they persecuted him everywhere he went. The idea of it was is that when when this book is written, or this letter is written that, It's to tell these people who are finding it hard and finding it difficult and finding this newfound faith and walk with Christ that they have to turn away from it and turn back to the temple and turn back to the blood of animals and turn back to the rituals and turn back to the dead works of religion. And of course, this book is written to show that Christ is everything that they need, that everything is centered upon Christ and that he is the author of eternal salvation to everyone that obeys him or follows him. And the idea of it is that in Christ, the man who died on the cross, the man who went to the grave, and who was raised again the third day, the man who was man of very man, yet God of very God of very God, who is ascended into glory and glorified and seated at the right hand of God, here uh, the, the writer is saying, keep your eyes off this worldly system and keep your eyes away from dead and lifeless religion keep your eyes away from it and and even in hard times people might say well it's easier if i don't step out in god it's easier if i don't 
do something for God. It's easier if I don't press into the things of God. If I don't uh, catch fire for God and with a heart of passion and I turn away from this. This is the exact reason that the book of Hebrews was written. To show the superior superiority of Christ. That he is sovereign and superior than all of the sacrifices that man could do. That all of the gifts and offerings that man could offer. That the great edifice that was then is the temple. Remember, this is written before the destruction of the temple. Because he speaks of the, uh, those who are serving the temple at that time. And then he speaks of us after AD 30. Because Christ has risen from the dead. He's offered himself as our sacrifice. And here we're finding that the writer here is, is showing the difference of the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. What we mean, his finished work, uh, simply meaning that your debt is paid in full. Your sin has been paid in full. Even the very sinful, rotten nature that man has, that the pre, the, the pre of nature that we all uh, walk around with and bear, even that Christ has paid the debt in full. That on the cross when he shed his blood, that on the cross when he cried, it is finished. We looked at it last week and he shed his blood. It, it was all paid for, nothing to add to the work which Christ had wrought on the cross. But in the temple, they're still sacrificing animals. And in the temple, they're still shedding blood. And here the Hebrew writer is saying, the blood of Jesus Christ is more than enough. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is more than enough, and his eternal work is far superior than the temple's temporal work. They had to come back and sacrifice again, and sacrifice again, and sacrifice again. Every day, sacrificing. But when Christ shed his blood, his blood was sacrificed once, or shed once and for all, and his blood this evening still avails for all of our sin. His blood shall never lose his power. Amen. Notice here, the idea is through the trial and the testing and the tribulation and the turmoil and the trouble in the service of Christ. Now listen, I know you can turn on your guy Christian channels and you can watch them if you want. I don't watch them if, unless there's something I'm looking for. And you can watch them all you want and you'll hear of 10 ways to have a blessed life and five ways to have a great day and you can hear all of that and it sounds lovely and it'll tickle your ears and you know if you come to Jesus and say this wee prayer it's all, it's all going to be floating to, floating to glory and, and, a, and a wonderful wafting handbasket. Hearts and flowers bursting and popping every day of your life and I want to tell you that's not true. I never knew there was a devil really until I gave my life to Christ. I never knew that there was a, a spiritual battle and spiritual warfare until I got saved and born again. I never knew that even the devil truly really existed until I found out that God truly really existed. You'll find, friends, the same that testing and trial and tribulation and turmoil and trouble were these, these men and women who had come away from Judaism, who had come away from the Jews' religion and place their faith in Christ and they profess Christ as their Lord and their Savior. You'll find now with all of this trouble, they're starting to weak, weaken and to wane. They're starting to turn back again. They're realizing that, well, maybe it's easier if we just go back to the temple and say we've made a mistake. How many Christians today, how many people, I should say, profess Christ profess Christ as their Savior and profess Christ as their Lord. How many is it uh, that even come and they're like a shooting star in the church and, and suddenly they fizzle out and they burn out and they drop out of the sky? And you see what's happened is because something has happened, discouragement and disillusionment and trial and trouble and testings come and, and what we find is, is they, they decide to take the lower seat. 
decide to go back to the world or even if they've come from a dead religious lifestyle, they go back to that religion because, you know, I could go there and there was no responsibility here. I could come and go. But when a man and a woman truly hears the word of God, when a man and woman truly come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal savior, when a man and a woman sit under the word of God and I mean the word of God, responsibility comes to your heart. Responsibility is yours tonight. Responsibility is yours. What do you do with that word tonight? Because God has brought you under the sound of his word. These people are turning away and maybe there's some here and you're waning in your faith or maybe you've backslidden for years or maybe you've fallen away in heart and no one even knows about it. You don't need to go into the world to be backslidden, you know. You can be cold and backslidden in heart. And your love for Christ is no longer the same flame that it was. Surrender life in the yielded spirit, in the heart given over to God, filled with love from and for the Lord Jesus Christ. In this life, we'll find that everything that is in Christ, remember, He is the author of eternal salvation, He is the, the bringer forth that gives the idea that everything resides in him everything it's not i believe in jesus but i must do alms for my salvation it's not i believe in jesus but i must give this for my salvation or go here or do whatever else friend no it's christ plus nothing christ plus nothing notice these people who had yielded themselves to God were thinking of turning away and the Hebrew writer writes this long letter to show them the superiority that is in the Lord Jesus Christ that every single thing they need, every single thing for their redemption and salvation is found in a person, not in a brick temple. And it's not in a cathedral either. Amen. It's not in a cathedral either. The Apostle Paul tells us about tribulations and trials in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And listen to what he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The things that you're going through, brother, tonight, the things that you're maybe going through, sister, tonight, maybe the things you've left at home, maybe you've come away from a terrible situation and you've just came because you want to be in the house of God and God bless you but I can tell you no matter what it is no matter who it's from no matter what direction it comes to you I can tell you you stay close to the Savior and you follow on after him and you pursue hard into his presence and you'll find that the temporal things of this world they may hurt you they may disillusion you they may disappoint you but the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal why this is all temporal and there's a far exceeding weight of glory waiting for you. In Isaiah chapter 64 and 4, it is rehearsed again in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 by the Apostle Paul. And he says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men. Notice that. The eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and hasn't entered into the heart. See, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You see, here's the thing. You see, we hear and we see many things. The eye gate and the ear gate. We hear and we see maybe things even that God is doing. The eye gate and the ear gate, but it doesn't drop into the heart. <coughs> Am I speaking to someone and it hasn't dropped into the heart yet? Oh, you've heard about this Christ and you've heard about this Savior and you've heard about his sacrifice and you've heard about the blood and you've heard about the grave and you've heard about the resurrection. Sure, we, we hear about it all the time. And I've seen people change and I've seen lives turned around and I've seen men and women going on with God. But as for me, I just can't get it. Oh, friend, if you feel the tug of the Spirit tonight, you feel a moving of God, the Holy Ghost tonight, speaking to you and dealing with you and drawing you, stirring up your heart and making you alive unto the word of God, then you must receive him tonight. Not just with the eye, 
not just with the ear, but in the heart. In the heart. God is a God of the heart. Will you turn with me to Matthew 16? Matthew 16, please. Just a few verses. Verse 24, the Lord Jesus is speaker. It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're living in a world of plenty. We're living in a world of the gimmies. They give me this and they give me that and the, the I'mies, I'm this and I'm that and I'm the other thing. We're living in a world where it's luxuries and pleasures and me, myself and I and selfishness of man's heart. We're living in it when we don't want to surrender the things to God. We don't want to surrender what God has placed his finger on in our life. We don't want to surrender because maybe we like it too much and we're comfortable with it. But it was my heart's desire. But if God, the Holy Ghost, is putting his finger on it tonight, brother, sister, my advice to you is yield it unto God. You can never outgive the Lord. You can never outgive him. Notice here, it's taking up his cross and follow me. Notice the difference between the cross of Christ and the cross of the Christian. This is the cross of the Christian. The difference between the cross of Christ is that there is where we're saved. It's at the cross of Christ where he shed his blood is where you're saved. Taking up your cross, the cross of the Christian is where you're sanctified. Taking up your cross daily and walking in the grace of God and walking with the help of of the Holy Spirit. If any man deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, notice, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? If he gain, shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Notice, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. There's payment day coming. There's a payment day coming when every man and woman will be rewarded according, as it were, to their works. In the penultimate chapter of the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, if you'll turn with me, please. Chapter 12. And in verse 18... He says, for you're not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Here are two examples of what happened with Israel in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. Now the word Sinai isn't there, but we know that's the mount we're speaking about. And here the Hebrew writer is writing to them and saying, look, remember Mount Sinai. What does Mount Sinai mean? What does it stand for? What does Mount Sinai say unto you? The mount that might not be touched in verse 18. You can't even touch this mountain. It's a physical mountain. There it is. Israel encamped around the borders of it and the bottom of it, yet not allowed to touch it when the glory of God came down on it. And this actually, the mount that might not, be, might not be touched gives the idea of someone groping in the dark. I'm afraid to touch something here. It's the idea of it. I'm afraid to touch something here. Israel were afraid to touch it, even a beast. The Lord says it's not to come near, for he is holy. And even in verse 20, if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it gives the idea that it's so sacred and you're not ready for my glory. Yet Jesus is coming in the glory of his Father and the angels. Jesus is coming to receive his elect church. And many millions aren't ready. They're not ready to behold his glory. 
They're not ready to see him come in the clouds. They're not ready to be in his presence. They're not ready. Are you ready tonight? Well, I'm saved, I'm saved, good then, you're ready, but are you serving? Notice, too sacred for anything to touch. By the way, this is Exodus 19 when God comes down to marry Israel. Moses is the officiator, and here Moses is petrified in his presence. Now think about it, Moses, yes, he was only a man, but Moses, who's seen the burning bush, the burning bush in all of the deserts of the wilderness of Sinai. Moses, Moses, take thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where all my standest is holy ground. Why was it holy? Because the presence of God was there. Tabernacle, skins of animals in a wilderness, a glorified tent. And in the holy place of there, it was holy. Listen, not only in the wilderness, but in the whole world. You couldn't find God anywhere else but in the tabernacle. Do you know that? Because God says to Moses, I will meet you there and speak with you there. If you want to meet me, he says, you'll come my way. And if you want to meet me, you'll be where I tell you to meet you. It's not how you come. It's not how your friends have come. It's you come how I tell you. Here is the very presence of God and the holiness. And only the high priest of Israel could go in once a year. That's how holy it was. And then the temple in Jerusalem became that. The holiest place in all of the earth. For there God came down. And he came upon the mercy seat of blood sprinkling. And then it failed. It failed whenever... They started to bring in the commandments of men and their dead religion. They started to twist it with Talmudism and all this stuff started to come in. Judaism is formed out of it. God sends his only begotten son to the cross and holiness was put outside the city walls. And the only place in the whole of the world at that time was outside the city walls. Christ was crucified outside the city walls. Notice, friend, brothers and sisters, the only way you and I can stand in his presence on the day whether our breath should leave us or he return, the only way we can stand in his presence is if we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, if we're fully, holy, solely, only, uniquely, and truly trusting in what Christ has done for us and in nothing else. Saved and serving when the master returns. Twice, verse 18 and 20, the mount that might be touched. In other words, it was a physical mountain you could touch, but in verse 20, but you dare not. You dare not. It's like you're saying to the child, you know, See that fire? They weren't even taking it under notice. Don't you touch it. Next thing they're thinking, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> it's not true. And oh, God's word tells these Hebrew Christians, these uh, Judaite converts, calls them and says, don't go to the temple. It's done. It's finished. And AD 70, it was torn down. From verse 22 to verse 24, quickly I'll rhyme these out and then we'll look at them briefly. We have the privileges of the saved, the privileges of the redeemed. Well, what are you taking me away from? My great cathedral or trusting in a denomination or, or whatever it may be in, in, in our modern days or even in another temple to be built. What are you taking me away from? And what have you got to offer, friend? What we have to offer is Christ alone. We find there's no, there's no need of anyone else. There's no need of anything else. Verse 22, we have Mount Zion. Notice, Mount Zion. Here are the true Zionists. Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, unto the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels, 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice that. And then when we come down to number seven, to Jesus. Ken, what, what, what is it you're... What, what is it you're turning me to? Are you turning me to become a, a member of CET? Not, not in the slightest. Do you know good? Well, what is it you're turning me to? Well, I'm not turning you. It takes the Lord to turn you. And if you're turning, it's the Lord that's turning you. It's his spirit that's turning you. It's his spirit that's moving you. It's him that's calling you. But what will he call you to? Well, he'll call you to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto Jesus. Unto Jesus. Unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Notice, and the eighth one is to the sprinkling of blood that speaketh better things of that than Abel. Notice this. Tell me why are we not consumed by the God of verses 18 and 20? The God came down in the mountain. Why are we not consumed by the God of verse 18 and 20? It cannot be touched. I'll tell you why. Because of verse 24. And unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling. You know why you're not consumed? We're not consumed. And you know why we won't be consumed in his coming? Or we won't be in a fiery judgment should we leave this life and we stand before God? Do you know why we won't be consumed? Do you know why we won't be damned? Do you know why we won't be in a, a lake of fire? That is those of us who are trusting in him because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood of Jesus in the new covenant. Notice verse 22, but you are come to Mount Zion. I, I, I thought about this, you know, we talk about we're marching to Zion when we sing it, and that's a good hymn, I like that one. We talk about Zion, and we think of maybe Jerusalem, and yes, we think of it that way. But here, the the writer is saying, you're coming to Zion, is you're coming to a heavenly new Jerusalem. Who is the new Jerusalem? It's you and I who are saved. It's the redeemed of the Lord. We are the true Zionists. It's the blood washed, and the blood bought. And the redeemed. Notice this. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. See the words, but ye are come. I, I searched out and I tried to look out the best I could from a few of the Greek writers I had to see what, the, what they would say on this. Do you know what they came up with? It gives the idea as ye are come unto Mount Zion or ye are approaching. You ready? Ye are approaching as true worshippers. Ye are approaching as true worshippers. Another one says, Ye can enter the Holy of Holies. Come into Zion, the Holy of Holies that was in the temple, the Holy of Holies that was in the tabernacle, that holy place that was in the desert. Take your shoes from off your feet, for the place where all now standest is holy ground. That Holy of Holies, knew where it is now, in the person of Christ, uh, the author of eternal salvation. And we are come right into the holy place in him. This is what it means. We're come unto Mount Zion. We're come unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice John chapter 4, if you will, please. I'm sure everyone will know where I'm going to. If when you, as soon as you turn to it and you get to know the chapter. And just for time's sake, the Lord Jesus meets a woman at a well. Must needs go through Samaria and they have dialogue between them jesus asked for water the woman says nothing to draw with and he says if you ask me of water i'd give you the spirit of god that's it paraphrasing let your eye run down to verse 19 the woman says the woman saith unto him sir i perceive that thou art a prophet our fathers worshiped in this mountain and ye say notice that in jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship jesus saith unto her woman believe me Lord, I believe you. Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. 
We know what we worship for salvation is off the Jews. Notice, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know where the woman was coming on to Zion? <laughs> this woman was coming on to Zion. He says, listen, there's a temple in Jerusalem. Jesus is God. He knew what was going to happen. And he says, there's going to come a time when they won't be worshiping there and you won't worship up here, but the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and the true worshipers will worship him in the truth of the word. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, this is whom we're come on to. You know, many times and many people I've spoken to and, they, and they're sitting with, uh, I want to be careful, and, and they're sitting with places where, uh, you know, it's, they don't know whether, the people don't know whether they're coming or going, they're, they're, they're kneeling, they're standing, they're sitting, they're bowing, they're doing, and they're reciting, they're, 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 they're back and forward with one says one part and another says another and back and forward, and they're saying it's killing them. I'm saying it's It's dead. It's all about symbols and regalia and, and all of this sort of religion. And, 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 and Christ is the living hope. Amen. He is the hope of salvation. He is salvation. Well, brothers and sisters, let's, let's live for Christ. If Christ lives in you, if Christ lives in you, you will live for Christ. Amen. If Christ lives in you, brother, if Christ lives in you, sister, if Christ lives in you, young person, no matter the age you are, if Christ lives in you, then you will live for Christ. Come on to Mount Zion. To approach it means as worshipers. Not in Jerusalem, but in spirit and in truth. I don't know where you were worshiping today. Well, we were here today, obviously. We worshiped here and we'll worship here tonight. I worshiped him in the kitchen this morning. And then I went when nobody was up and I worshiped him in the, in the living room. And then I worshiped him walking up and down the hall a wee bit. Just talking to him, telling him how much I loved him. What he meant to me. I worshiped the Lord Jesus in spirit and in truth. We're worshiping him here and there's other places who are preaching the word and truth and they're worshiping him there. There's people who've just went to bed on the other side of the world probably and, and they've worshiped him all day and when we go to bed, there's ones behind him and from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Amen. See, there's spirit worshipers all over. Notice, It means to approach his worshipers or to enter into the Holy of Holies. Listen to Arthur W. Pink. Listen to what he said. Man in his natural estate is far too carnal to be pleased with a worship in which there is nothing calculated to fire the imagination and intoxicate the senses by means of tangible objects. But they who worship in spirit and in truth can draw nigh to God more joyously in a barn <laughs> and mingle their praise with the songs of heaven than if they were in a cathedral. It's not about the building. It's not about the temple made with hands. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Who knows that song? Know ye not, know ye not, you are the temple. Who knows it? Let's see your hands. Oh, come on. Is that it? Half a dozen years. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're filled with power, filled with praise, filled with glory. Filled with power, full of praise, full of glory. Full of power, full of praise, full of glory. 
Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We'll have to learn just that one. You sing that more. Mount Sinai speaks of fear and terror. Mount Zion, love and forgiveness. Mount Sinai is in the desert and barrenness of land, and Mount Zion is the city of the living God. Mount Sinai is earthly, speaks of earthly things, but Mount Zion is heavenly. Mount Sinai is only Moses could draw near unto the mount, but on Mount Zion many are offered to come. Mount Sinai shows guilty men in fear before God. Mount Zion shows the spirits of just men made perfect in Christ. Mount Sinai shows Moses as the mediator of the law. Mount Sinai, Sion, shows Jesus, the mediator of grace in the new covenant. Mount Sinai shows the old covenant ratified by the sprinkling of the blood of animals. Mount Sion shows the new covenant ratified by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mount Sinai is law. Mount Zion is grace. I'm glad of the grace of God. Amen. Don't deserve him. <clears throat> For example, notice what it says here. Let your eye run down and turn to Hebrews chapter 12 again, please. Verse 24, unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The, the new covenant is that from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not the, as in the old covenant I made with their fathers. And then he says, I will write my law in their hearts. Of course, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 to 10 rehearses this. And the Lord Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, we're told, and when he had he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is the new covenant. This is the new covenant that Christ hath made with us, the sprinkling of blood. In Leviticus 16, we have the high priest of Israel sprinkling the blood over the mercy seat in the tabernacle, that little, uh, if you want, badger skin uh, tent, and there was the first curtain to go through it, and then behind the second, which is, the Holy of Holies, where God would come. And there we have the, the furniture, but there's the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box overlaid with gold. And the lid upon the wooden box that was overlaid with gold is called, that wooden lid, that golden lid, is called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. And here comes a high priest with the, the, the 12 stones on the breastplate of judgment. Notice judgment. He comes to God with the names of Israel, every tribe on the 12 stones. And he comes before God saying, we're guilty before you. We deserve judgment. But he comes and he sprinkles the blood upon the lid of this covenant ark. And here is the guilty sinner. And here is the glory of God. And the only thing that stops God consuming the guilty sinner was the blood on the mercy seat. And the Lord says, when I see the blood, he's looking for the blood, brothers and sisters. The high priest would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And then that little wooden box, there was a pot of manna. There were the tablets of the law broken. And thirdly, there was the rod, iron's rod, which budded, blossomed, and bloomed. Listen. The pot of manna speaks of Israel's murmuring. We're hungry, we want bread, and they murmured. And the idea isn't they just weren't hungry and they wanted bread. The idea is they got into a fixed position in their hearts and in their minds. Nothing was going to satisfy them, nothing was going to do them, and no one else could help them. And they got into this blinded stupor, and the word murmuring isn't just complaining all the time. It means they're fixed in a position away from God. It's the idea of it. It's not just they were complaining all the time. They were fixed with a heart that was hard and calloused with the things of God. And even as Pastor Orrin said this morning, 
You're looking for onions and leeks and cucumbers. God's provision is not enough. See, that's the world today. That's what men and women think. The provision of God for salvation is not enough. What Christ has done on the cross is not enough. And so it has to be the ritual and the garments, and it has to be all the ceremony and the pump. It has to be because man's pride has him do something. If I can't do something, and I don't know if I'm saved, but if I complete it, if I complete it, then I'll know I'm saved. I know in the temple they labored away hard. They labored away hard. No, no, don't go to the temple. Come by grace on the Mount Zion. Come on to Jesus, the author of eternal salvation, because in him is eternity. Notice the pot of manna spoke of Israel's murmuring. The tablets of the law speaks of the breaking of the law. The broken tablets, they broke the law of God. You and I have broke the law of God. Thou shalt not kill. Well, I haven't killed anybody. Maybe some have, but literally, I mean, maybe some haven't. But in the heart. Jesus says, if you hate your brother, your sister, in your heart, God sees it as murder. You've broken the commandments. Thou shalt not steal what? Not, not a second of your boss's time. Breaking the law of God. I shall not commit adultery. Oh, you might not have actually went out and done the literal deed. Some may have, but some may not. But here's the thing. Even to think it with lust in your heart. Jesus says you're an adulterer. Wow. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He fulfilled it and he amplifies it. He lets us see the real depravity of our hearts. He says, you're, you know what he said? I'll just say it bluntly. It's like saying you're worse than you even thought you were. You're even worse than you thought you were. You know, it shows us how much we need the Savior. It shows us how much we need the blood. It shows us how much we need his grace. And the law was in there. Spooks of the transgression and the law breaking and the, the rod spoke of rebellion because they, they wanted to overtake. They wanted to take over God's anointed leader and high priest that was going to be Aaron and his family. And they wanted to take it. The sons of Korah, oh, they were angry at this. And they laid down the rods before God and the one that would bud blossom, bud, blossom and bloom. That would be the one that was God's choice and it was Aaron's rod. Rebellion against God. And rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft to God. Am I speaking tonight of a, to a rebellious heart? God has spoken. God has wrestled with you. God has called you. God has dealt with you. And you still rebelled against him. You know to do right and you do wrong. And you're still rebelling against him. And he's called you into a place of prayer. And he's called you into a place of fellowship. He's called you into a place of reading his word. And he's called you into a place with him. And he's told you to go somewhere. And you've rebelled time and time again. And he's told you to lay that sin down. And he's told you to be separate from the world. And stay away from all ungodly friends. Because they're drawing you down. And they're taking you further into the depths of the world. And I'm speaking to a man who's heard the gospel time and time and time again. Night after night after night. And you say, not tonight, but another time. You're rebelling against God and he sees it as the son of witchcraft. God forgive us. I'm glad. I'm glad for the sprinkling of the blood. It's the blood of the lamb that enables us to go on. It's the cleansing power of the blood. And I know the Holy Ghost is speaking tonight. Here's one thing, another way to look at it. Bread of life, the manna. You can look at it and that's it all. Look, murmuring, oh no. The bread, the murmuring against God. The transgression, the law breaking, oh no. The condemnation of it. And thirdly, you look at it and you see the rod Arms rot. Oh, the rebellion. It's like the set of witchcraft before God. I'm doomed and I'm done for. Here's a way to look at it. The bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. 
He came to take our place. He's our substitute on the cross, brothers and sisters. He is the bread of life. He is the bread of God, came down from God. He's the manna which God sent down that we might live through him. The law, he came to keep the law that was broken in that box, that was broken in our hearts, that was broken in Israel. He came and he kept the law to a T. He kept the law you couldn't keep. He lived a life you couldn't live. And he hung and bled and died in our room instead. Uh, well, what about then the rod then? What does it stand for? <laughs> well, if it's not rebellion, I'll tell you what it stands for. So all these sticks were put out, these old sticks. Old dead, lifeless sticks. And that morning when they got up, there was orange rod, an old stick at night, and there was lovely wee blooming flowers on it, wee almond buds and all on it. Isn't that lovely? It speaks of resurrection. Amen. The resurrection of Christ. Yes, Here we have the resurrected Savior. And oh, the lid over it. It's called the mercy seat or the propitiation seat. And it's, we're told by the apostle John that Christ is the propitiation of our sins. I've told you this before, but some of you might not have heard it. I'm going to say it again. It's like going to a big dam. And the dam, let's just make it ridiculous. The dam is 500 foot high. And you're right at the foot of it. And there are the five depths of it behind it. Billions upon trillions and trillions of gallons of water. And it's holding all of that water back. And there you are. And there is a, let's make it really ridiculous. It's a thousand miles that way. And it's a thousand miles long that way. And suddenly a big crack comes down the dam and you see it starting to waver and to buckle and suddenly it bursts and all of the deluge of it starts to come out. Millions upon trillions of gallons after gallons to come to consume you. You can't run that way because you can't outrun it. You can't go to the left side because there's a thousand miles you never get away. And you can't go to the right because there's a thousand miles to the right. You just can't get away from this deluge that's coming to wipe you out. Such is the judgment of God. But propitiation means this. Suddenly, as it's about to just take its wrath and vengeance upon you, a big chasm just opens in the ground, right at your feet, and every single gallon, every single liter, every single pint of water, every little minuscule drop goes into the chasm, and there's not a splash of one drop upon your foot. You see, that's propitiation. Jesus took it all at Calvary. You see, we couldn't get away from the wrath and the judgment of God. But Jesus came and he hung and he bled and died in Calvary and he paid your debt and he paid my debt that the fullness of God's wrath was poured out like that water upon his son that day as he hung and bled and died in Calvary. And guess what? If you're in Christ and you're trusting him, there's not one drop, uh, not one speck of it will come upon you from the wrath of God because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have something to shout about. Something to shout about. We have something to glory in, not in ourselves, but in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I promised myself I wasn't going to lose my voice again. I used to sprinkle the blood seven times toward the people. Over Israel, here's your blood. Seven the number of perfection here. Here's the covering of the atoning blood. It's now being made in the holy place and it arrives, as it were, from the heavenlies, only it's in the earth, right down here among the people. They used to sprinkle it seven times for perfection. And then they used to get the goat and the day of atonement as well. And they used to get one goat and another and they slew one and the blood of one was put upon the other and a strong man laid hands on it. In fact, some Jewish writers actually say there was a red cord put around the scapegoat's neck and a man went 10 miles out of the city, right outside the city walls. Hallelujah, Jesus was took outside the walls and crucified uh, and they didn't even know what they were doing. And it says, now they say this, it's not in the word, but they say that whenever the scarlet cord turned white, then you it was far enough away, your sins are far from the east as from the west. It's not too many. Here's a thought for you. Here's a thought for you. When we accept the blood washing and atonement of the blood of Christ, Jesus' garments were stained by his blood at Calvary, stripped naked, and put it on, the blood's on it. But we're told the next time we see him, there's no blood stain. The red garments are simply glorified white. Glorified and white. I'm closing. Thank you for your attention. 
1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For as much as ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from the vain conversation, received by the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9 and 14. For as much as ye shall, <clears throat> how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Notice what the Hebrew writer is saying. Now he's talking to these uh, Christian Israelites. These, he's talking about Hebrew Israelites. He's talking to Judaites and coming from the Jews' religion. And he's talking to them and he's saying, look, he said, look, you've come away from that. Don't go back to it. Notice what he says in Hebrew 9. Hebrews 9 and verse 12. It's neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Do you see that? He's telling them outright, you don't go there. And I'm hearing all the time about the, the, the temples being built. Listen, the temple doesn't mean that. It's his blood. It's his blood. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, how much more shall the blood of Christ be through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? Your conscience wasn't clear with the dead works in the temple, but Christ purges the conscience. And then we're told in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. This is my last point. It's only a short one. Hebrews 12 and verse 24 says, The blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, I know, and I understand where they come from, that people say Christ's blood was better than Abel's blood when Cain killed Abel and his blood was on the ground. And he's, that's true, Christ's blood is better than Abel's blood. But that's not what this means. That's, that's not what it means. When Adam and Eve sinned, were put out of the garden, Cain and Abel come with their offering. Cain comes with the work of his hands, with his religion, <coughs> the fruit of the ground. Look at, see how hard I labored? My patience with this. And he's rejected by God. Abel comes and slices the lamb's throat and empties his blood before God on an altar. God had respect onto that blood. That's what it means. See the blood that God had respect on that Abel came as an offering with. The blood of Christ is greater than that. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is greater than that. So in the book of Hebrews, to summarize this up, and if you want to ask or listen to it later, you'll get these scriptures. The book of Hebrews tells us, and I need to do studies in this, we just are stuck for time. Jesus is better than the prophets. He's greater than the prophets. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in this last day spoken unto us by his Son, by whom he made war, and so on. Jesus is greater than the angels. Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 13. Jesus is greater than Moses. Hebrews 3, 1 to 16. Jesus is greater than Joshua. Hebrews 4, verses 4 to 11. Jesus is greater than Aaron, the high priest of Israel, and his ministry. Hebrews 4 and 14 and chapter 8 and verse 6. Jesus officiates at a better tabernacle. Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 and 6. Jesus' testament of the new covenant is better than the old. Hebrews 8 verses 6 to 10. And Jesus' blood sacrifice is better than all. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 to 20. Brothers and sisters, friend, he is the author of eternal salvation in him, in Christ, is eternity, is salvation. Friend, are you saved tonight?
What if, what if you left this life and you stood before him? Are you ready? I don't know how I'll be. Well, you need to make sure you know how you'll be. I, 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 one time I put a hand up in a meeting. Listen, never mind a hand up in a meeting. It's a heart regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Are you saved? Are you saved? God bless his word to us this evening. And may God continue to speak while man's voice is silent. That's just by a word of prayer. Father, take your word and continue to speak when my voice is silent. And I pray that my voice was not heard at all, but the voice of the Spirit. And elevate the blood of Christ to every heart tonight. May your people be encouraged again at a fresh look at their Savior. And Lord, help us to turn away from man-made works and religions to serve the living God. We love you and we worship you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.